keynote speaker. Um, <coughs> Todd Schweitzer uh, from Brancas. Uh, welcome, Todd. Uh, Hi, John. Good morning. Good morning. So um, Brancas is a, um, a great API enabler. I, 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 that's, that's my term. I don't know if you want to pick that up uh, in, in your marketing, but you're a great API enabler across, uh, across Southeast Asia. So um, where you, you're based in the Philippines, but a lot of your team are based in Indonesia and you work across the, across the region. So we're really looking forward to, uh, to your perspective on how to, how to uh, connect the digital economy in Southeast Asia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. And, and thanks so much to the API Days team. Um, it's been great having participated in a couple of these. It's been really exciting to see how much the event has grown, especially in Southeast Asia, and how much interest there is um, from across Tech, across the startup industry and even traditional industries that are now looking at API technologies to enable um, their business. And I think, John, you and the APIDs team is, is at the center of bringing that community together. Um, so it's been really exciting to see and, and very grateful to be a part of this. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Schweitzer. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rankas. Um, we are an open banking, open finance technology company operating across Southeast Asia. Our first market um, was and continues to be Indonesia, although we now operate across Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and Singapore being the main markets and others to come. Um, a few caveats. So I think Juan gave a fantastic presentation on you know, FMCG and e-commerce. Mine is going to be more focused on financial services and, and fintech APIs as an enabler for the digital economy. I am also not uh, a, a very a deeply technical person. and Rightly so, what I want to present is what do fintech APIs look like in the real world in Southeast Asia today? So I think you know, it's, it's, it's easy, especially talking to partners or clients to get bogged down in the infrastructure when the reality of open banking and open finance APIs is real new fintech products that can be used by day-to-day -day consumers and, and online businesses. So I want to touch a little bit on that as well. Um, I'll try and get through this pretty quick because I would hope that the audience is asking questions. I would love to reserve five, 10 minutes at the end um, to, to, to cover your questions. So with that, um, I will dive in. Uh, so I already mentioned I'm the CEO and co-founder of Broncos. We're an open banking technology company. We're about four and a half years old. The way I think about what Broncos does is we're building open banking technology for emerging economies, right? And this means really two big things that we're doing. Number one is working with financial institutions to help them launch and publish open APIs as products, as banking products. Now, this could be related to data, identity, payments, account opening, loan origination. We'll get into some examples um, soon, but really it's about helping on the infrastructure side, helping banks and other financial institutions to very quickly deploy a pr new FinTech or, or traditional financial services, but delivered through API or distributed through API. And that is a real bottleneck right now. I think the COVID situation has, has, has revealed to many financial institutions how important it is to have connections to FinTech partners or to their corporate clients via a scalable technology, um, but they frankly don't have the infrastructure and working with a development shop or a, a large IT provider may be a multi-million dollar, multi-year project and so Broncos works on the FI side to help them very quickly launch that API infrastructure. We also provide API aggregation for fintechs and really any online business to use open APIs from that bank partners have made available. Um, so that, and again, that could be for payments, identity, account data, even account opening. Um, uh, for, for fintech partners. Um, we're also building region-wide fintech API infrastructure, which is a lot of buzzwords. But what that really means is we're working with the Singapore government in particular on two big initiatives. One is called Apex, which is the API marketplace and really a place to connect FIs and fintechs, as well as Proxera, which is a cross-border B2B financing and trading platform. Um, we cover about 82% of the Indonesian market today in terms of customer base, 60% uh, of the Philippines consumer and SME market. And I'm proud to say we're the first PISP, which that's, that's 
European open banking terms, but really we're the first retail payments API initiation provider in Thailand and live with the top three banks. So just some context about where I'm coming from. I think being in Southeast Asia, we are really fortunate to be in a super exciting time for open finance economy. I think, and it's worth just kind of taking some perspective of why open APIs are so important to the digital finance economy of Southeast Asia. I think number one is Southeast Asia Financial Services is undergoing massive disruption to the benefit of customers, right? Um, it's a highly profitable, the traditional financial services sector is highly profitable. Highly profitable means not as competitive as it could be uh, among, the, among the traditional players. And this is the, the result of this is you have over 60% unbanked in, in, in a market like the Philippines or, or Vietnam, right? Um, so, so what we're seeing is massive inefficiencies, incumbent players, frankly speaking, uh, you know, uh, avoiding certain customer segments because they see the cost to serve is too high. And open APIs can change the economics to serve those customer groups that have been neglected in the past. It is also, Southeast Asia is also fascinating because it's a big tech battleground, really. And if, if you think about what Tencent has been doing in terms of its investments, what Ant Financial and Lazada and um, Alipay have been doing around the region and, and their investment, um, what C Group has been doing, they've been super aggressive and, and, and really exciting to see how quickly uh, C Group has been launching new fintech products. Grab, Gojek, and potentially Gojek, or the Tokojek, right? The Go, Gojek Tokopedia merger. I mean, these are all big multi billion dollar tech players that are making massive investments and um, creating a competitive threat to the incumbent banks, which is a good thing for the benefit of customers. Uh, I think also every one of these Southeast Asia markets is seeing new digital banks, um, either digital because there's a new digital banking regime or because you know they're, they're doing things like buying you know, um, smaller regional bank licenses and, and, and putting a digital platform on top of that. Um, and a number of non-bank alternatives that are offering you know, substitute products to, to what a, a typical bank would provide. I also think, and this is under-recognized, open API development in financial services in Southeast Asia is being industry-led. This is not a top-down regulator mandate. This is banks, fintechs, other lenders, insurance companies, e-wallets that see commercial value in building API products, right? And this is very different from the European model. The European model is this is a compliance exercise and okay, let's figure out how to monetize. And maybe there will be some fintechs that pop up in the middle in order to provide simplified APIs. That, that is not the case in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is entirely bottom up industry led because the players see ways to treat this as a chance to generate new fee revenue, new customer acquisition, um, or, or really just change the economics of serving certain customer groups. That to me is super exciting because we're not rating for, you know, uh, this isn't a compliance activity turned into a business opportunity. This is this is new technology driving new business revenue pools. Um, so we see regulators in Indonesia in particular setting guidelines for customer consent, for data security, setting minimum technology standards. But, you know, we're not expecting to see a mandate that, you know, financial institutions have to provide these types of APIs at these performance levels. It's really much more of setting boundaries and saying within these boundaries, you know, you can, you can play. I think lastly, open finance APIs are solving fundamental gaps that don't that 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 uh, that that haven't been addressed in 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 markets like Indonesia, right? So, in the absence of a credit bureau or a FICO score in the U.S., right, the way that consumer lenders score their customers is based on bank statement data, right? And having verified bank statement data, not a PDF upload that could have been tampered with, right? In the absence of you know a car decent card penetration. Bank transfer is the preferred method of of of, of e-commerce payments, and in fact, in Indonesia, uh, last I checked, 80 plus percent of e-commerce transactions are bank transfer. Right now, many of those bank transfers are still intermediated, which is another discussion about why that is is increasingly unnecessary. Um, but really, what what open finance APIs can do is address some of the fundamental infrastructure gaps in financial services. So big message here, this is not, when, I, when we talk about open finance or open banking in Southeast Asia, this is not UK open banking. We're solving much more exciting, much more fundamental inefficiencies in the financial services industry um, 
And I think that's that's what makes this region so exciting for, for open finance. Okay, so I wanna share some examples. This is what open banking really looks like. I'm not gonna talk about infrastructure. I'm gonna talk about products that are currently in the market and, and hopefully it's encouraging, you know, those in the audience who represent the F financial institutions or represent tech companies or online businesses, you can think about what would be possible as more and more, you know, open APIs become available. So really four main categories that we see at Broncos. One is account information and data, right? So this is the AISP model out of Europe. This is for credit scoring, for identity verification, for accounting and budgeting. Um, number two is payments. And it's really pay direct payments, direct consumer to, to, to merchant without a middleman, right? And this can look like e-commerce checkout. This can look like topping up your e-wallet app or topping up your digital bank account. Um, it can look like standardized QR and dynamic QR payments in Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand. It can look like corporate disbursements API so that corporates can plug a bank API into their ERP system and automate payments without needing to top up a middleman who's keeping the funds on your behalf. That's an important point. And I think uh, biller aggregation is another example where we're seeing you know, entirely API driven ways to connect customers with the various day-to-day -day payables. Um, number three is account opening and origination. So this to me is really exciting because it's a way for financial service providers to acquire customers by providing uh, an API to, for partners to originate that customer on their behalf. So that is a completely different distribution cost structure and channel than your typical branch led or agent led model, right? I mean, it, it, it's a, the, the impact here is pretty significant. The fourth is authentication and single sign-on. So this is cutting edge, and there's only a handful of examples of this today, but they're in Southeast Asia, but this is basically proxy KYC. So if I, as a customer, have already done KYC with, us, with, um, with, uh, with Bank A or Insurer B, then I should be able to use that KYC as a way to proxy validate my identity on a, onboarding for a fintech. So... Some examples. So Philippines, Gcash is the, is one of the largest e-wallets today. And these are screenshots from my accounts uh, a while back. So I can link my union bank account to my Gcash. And I have a, a persistent token that allows me to, in the future, just top up my Gcash wallet whenever I want to, basically by just approving a, a top up amount. So I authenticate using the union bank's uh, online banking credentials. I'm entering a one-time password to confirm that I want to link my account. I'm choosing the accounts that I want to link, and that's it. And from that point forward, all I have to do is a one-tap, enter the payment amount, and then Gcash is then authorizing a debit. Well, Gcash is calling Union Bank's API to authorize a debit of my account and a credit into the Gcash wallet. Secondly, account opening through partner apps. So st staying with Gcash for a minute, so CIMB Philippines, which CIMB is, of course, across Southeast Asia, but in the Philippines is uh, uh, digital only. And they, are, they have a account origination API made available to Gcash, where Gcash customers can upgrade to a Gsave account, which is a co-branded Gcash CIMB account. And then they can uh, they can they can manage their savings account. CIMB can upsell them loan products. This is great for Gcash because of higher engagement. It's great for CIMB because it's a fantastically cheap customer acquisition channel. It's great for the customer because now they have in, an interest bearing option alongside their Gcash wallet, um, and it's been hugely successful for for all parties. Uh, statement aggregation. So this is the typical AISP model. These are actually screenshots from the Lloyds Bank app in the UK. Um, because there, there are a few banks that are, it's coming online soon, but there are a few banks that have made this available for, um, for yet in Southeast Asia, although this is coming in place this year. But this is the typical link your bank account, see your aggregate balance. You choose from a list of third-party banks. You give explicit consent that you're authorizing the sharing of data. In this case, sharing of your NatWest bank account with your Lloyds Bank app. And then Lloyds Bank will call the NatWest API to pull your transaction data and see it in a single view. Uh, it's worth noting statement aggregation is not for retail, it's also for corporate use cases. So in Singapore, we at Broncos use Zero for our accounting and we use UOB as one of our banks and we have linked our UOB account to our Zero accounting platform so that we're getting statement feeds and that's providing a way to do automated reconciliation and drastically improves our, our, our account, um, our day-to-day our -day accounting. 
Um, so statement aggregation has corporate use cases as well, and um, and 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 many online businesses and even traditional businesses are willing to pay for this feature because it drastically improves the ability to uh, reconcile and manage day-to-day uh, -day accounting. Third-party authentication. So the best example of this in Southeast Asia is on the right with Singapore, and this is using your SingPass as a single way to authenticate your identity signing into your OCBC account. Um, so very cool. This one is centrally led by the by the Singapore government, of course. Um, the second one we're seeing in Thailand is NDID. NDID will allow for proxy KYC so that if I already have uh, if I'm already an account holder with Bank A, I can then sign up for an account at Bank B by piggybacking on my KYC from Bank A, and then Bank B will pay some consideration to Bank A for use of the KYC. So it's it's um it's still in 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 the process of being piloted and developed, but it'll be a really exciting um, new way to to really remove the friction for for digital onboarding. Financing through e-commerce merchant sites. So this is an example I find so cool because this is Tokopedia merchant. Tokopedia, so Tokopedia in Indonesia, of course, one of the largest e-commerce uh, marketplaces. And now they have merchant inventory financing marketplace for Tokopedia merchants. So if I'm a Tokopedia merchant today, I can choose from 11 different lenders who are each providing an API for loan origination and lo and, sco and in instant scoring with Tokopedia. Now, Toko so if I opt in for a line of credit, I agree to share my Tokopedia merchant data with the various lenders, and then they come back instantly with a pre-qualification, and then I can actually uh, agree to and accept and be funded for that loan all through the Tokopedia site. So, there, so these are the lenders providing a loan origination API as well as um, disbursement APIs behind the scenes to enable um, instant, you know, an instant line of credit for Tokopedia merchants. And what's so cool about this example is look at the competitive marketplace here, right? So you have BFI, which is traditionally a multi-finance vehicle lender. You have uh, five banks, you have four startups, and one of the big e-wallets all competing for an inventory financing channel. This is great for Tokopedia because they share in the risk um, and the loan interest, but they also then um, can have their merchants selling more. It's great for the customer because the customer can access more inventory. And it's great for the lenders because they have a, a, a much more efficient distribution and, 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 and customer acquisition channel. So some other marketplace models, um, Union Bank is the number seven bank in the Philippines, but they've shifted to a digital first strategy. They've built up UBX, which is a product incubator, and they now have a marketplace of APIs. And they're one of the only banks in Southeast Asia that has a marketplace of APIs that are bank APIs alongside third-party APIs. Um, and they've really invested in building a, an API marketplace Owned, man, managed by the bank, but not only bank API products. And so I think we'll see more of this moving forward. Uh, SCB in Thailand. So SCB in Thailand does it in reverse. So SCB is offering an e-commerce mall called Easy Mall inside their consumer app. Now that seems a bit nuts on the surface because why would a bank build an e-commerce site inside of its app? Well, the reason for that is because all of the payment options and all of the financing options are SCB options. So you can have a super, as a customer, you can have a super clean checkout experience if you're buying a new mobile device using Jib, which is a well-known electronics uh, uh, online seller in, 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 in Thailand. But your payment options, whether it's pay with points, pay with credit card, pay with direct debit, pay with installments, are all SCB options. So this is a great way to engage the customer and sell them additional payment products. And this is all by having a, basically an API marketplace that allows third-party e-commerce partners to plug in and display their wares um, on, the, on the, the SCB app. Uh, there are also other, other marketplace models. I'm realizing we're coming up on time and I want to make sure we have uh, some time for questions. I think Starling Bank is a great example outside of Southeast Asia of what the future may look like. So Starling Bank is a digital bank, but they have focused hard on building a marketplace of third-party products that are available inside the Starling Bank app or outside um, where Starling Bank has an API connected um, and integrating the bank account inside, the, you know, for example, the Zero or QuickBooks uh, application. Um, so, 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 uh, what 
I want to point out about Starling Bank is a big part of the revenue model is a platform fee that they charge to these third-party apps. So this is, an, this is the financial services API version of the iOS app store or the Android Play Store, right? Um, this is a, a way for Starling Bank to actually unlock a new fee revenue channel, which is platform partner integrations and building their own app store. We haven't seen any banks do this at any real scale in Southeast Asia. Union Bank is dipping their toe with providing third-party APIs on their on their developer portal, but we haven't yet seen a platform bank at scale in in Southeast Asia. But I think we will soon. Um, the last the last uh, example again. This is this is looking ahead to the future, right? Is banking as a service, and this is of course a buzzword, but really this is banks providing their infrastructure as a service that fintechs can use and, and, and sit on basically sitting on the bank's infrastructure um, license and, and, and regulatory reporting. Um, and the banks are, again, unlocking a new revenue stream by offering a monthly license or a usage fee for each service. So some examples here, um, the, you know, really the only example in the region is Rails Bank um, with um, offering uh, Singapore-based uh, accounts that are white labeled for the likes of Neat or Airwallex. Um, but you know, I think the example that I love is is Community Federal Savings Bank with TransferWise. So if transfer in, with TransferWise or now Wise, if you want to have a bank, if you want to have a U.S. account for receiving funds you are using a bank account of some small, tiny New Jersey-based uh, bank that has a partnership with TransferWise, but TransferWise is opening millions of new account holders on their behalf so that TransferWise can accept uh, US, uh, US bank transfers, right? So I think as we see banks develop more and more open finance API products, we will see some of those banks offering white-labeled banking as a service solutions for fintechs to build new products on top. So I will stop there. I, I think there's a few questions. So um, happy to happy to jump in. I know I went through a lot of content, but there's uh, there's quite a lot to cover. Uh, Todd, thanks thanks very much for that. Uh, it really really set the scene for for what uh, we're, we're looking at across uh, across Southeast Asia. So we do have several questions, and I'll try to uh, uh, consolidate a couple of them because the first question was about credit scoring, but then you started talking about um, the uh, the Tokopedia e-commerce e, um, uh, e financing model. So the first question was sort of, does does Brankus assist with uh, the credit scoring? And I think you can also probably touch on how that um, how that also plays out in terms of the Tokopedia model that you showed. Yep. So. Uh... Brancas is in, so the short answer to that question is, we are such early days for open banking APIs that customers, and in this case, lenders and, and, and other um, company, you know, lenders or marketplaces that would want to use a credit score are not yet asking for detailed credit scoring or abstracted data because they're not doing fancy algorithms and detailed modeling. They're doing things like, what is the average cash flow or net income of a customer over the last six months, right? It's super basic income data, cash flow data, some volatility data, maybe a little bit of transaction categorization. Um, but it's not there. We're so early days that we're that, that customers are frankly just not asking for detailed um, credit scoring data. What they do need is verified bank statement data delivered instantly in a seamless way that doesn't impact the borrower experience so that they can onboard borrowers as fast as possible. So that's what Broncos focuses on from the data side is making sure that lenders or marketplaces that want to have access and where customers are giving consent to share that data, that Broncos can provide it in a super fast, um, compliant, um, and verified way to make sure that those lenders can use that data how they see fit. We are developing some, some new services around income and transaction categorization and, and data normalization, um, but that's in the pipeline. But today it's not in high demand um, to, to, to just be transparent. Okay, all right, great, thanks. And, and there was another question about policies and regulations and how what, what uh, governments what regulators in Southeast Asia are doing to, to lay the foundation. Now, you mentioned a couple of things, uh, the, the Sing Pass and also Thailand's uh, NDID, which notice they're both about digital identity, 
Um, but what other what other sorts of things do you see uh, regulators doing to help lay the foundations for for connecting? Yeah, to uh, yeah, good question. So. Uh, maybe I think Singapore and Thailand are actually exceptions in that they have a, a strong top-down mandate and a, and a, and a government-led push for certain infrastructure fixes. Um, you know, since this is API Days Jakarta, Indonesia is still at the. It it is still very much industry-led. Um, you all. Have, you have Bank Indonesia looking deeply into payments API standardization. Um, but that is really to create less friction among incumbent payment gateways and banks um, and the payment switches. So it's, it's more of an industry standardization rather than um, creating new standards for new players or new types of business models to enter. So I, 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 I hope that, that what, so what they're trying to solve today is, you know, making sure that the e-wallets, the banks, the payment switches, the central bank itself are all speaking the same language, literally speaking the same technical language in terms of how they're integrating APIs and not going out building ten different versions of ten different AP, uh, uh, ten different versions of the same of the same payment rail, for example. Mm -hmm. Right, um, but it's still in terms of you know a PISP model or open banking related to payments or data. It's still very very early days. Um, Brancas is working very closely with OJK in Indonesia and with the BSP in the Philippines. Philippines um, to support a an AISP led model, and um, I think we'll have some uh, some some interesting announcements to make soon because there's a number of banks that have indicated um, interest, formal interest, in participating in a account data sharing consortium. Um, and Broncos has been working on that, but we're still um, it's making its ways through. But but the, the the to summarize, it is a it is still industry led. It is still at the white paper stage. Um, really, at bo in both Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam, it's still in sort of the research and white paper phase. And so the short to medium term will be an industry-led initiative um, and a lot of regulator education to, to, to ensure that we're not, you know, that, that we're, we're matching whatever existing regulations are in place around things like mm -hmm. data privacy. Okay. And, and what, what regulation, what licenses does does Brancus need to have in order to make that connection between fintechs and, and financial institutions and even other players and, and financial yeah. institutions? Yeah, it's a good question. So in, in, in Indonesia, we are registered under Bank Indonesia's payments regulation. We are not registered as a payment gateway because we're not touching cash. We're not intermediating payment. We don't intend to be an, a, a payments intermediary at all. In fact, Broncos is not a payments company, but we have registered under Bank Indonesia's fintech framework because we are facilitating the APIs that that handle uh, direct debit payments, right? So we're registered as a as a as a payment facilitator with Bank Indonesia. In and in, under OJK, we'll be entering soon a, a new regulatory sandbox related to bank account data sharing. For Philippines, it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> um, uh, um, they they have regulation for online payment gateways, um, but there is not an AISP or PISP or API facilitator designation for fintech companies yet. Uh, likewise, in Thailand, um, th this regulation doesn't exist yet. So again, very early days and requiring a bit of, you know, proactively engaging the regulator to make sure that we're being transparent about what Broncos aims to do and that what we're doing is for the benefit of the digital economy and not trying to uh, step on anyone's toes, I suppose. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. There was another question about uh, open APIs for uh, non-bank, uh, non-financial services players. Um, but actually, we, we have a number of speakers who are going to talk about uh, different industry perspectives from telecommunications uh, to uh, to e-commerce to banking and their relationships yep. with, with companies. So we may hold that question. Um, to uh, to to address with others, but thanks very much, Todd, for uh, for sharing your uh, your your, um, your knowledge, uh, your understanding of the uh, of the digital economy in, in Southeast Asia and how to how to connect it. Um, My pleasure. Thanks so much for the time and thanks for the questions. Please feel free to contact me if you have others. I'm happy to happy to engage and and chew the fat on open open APIs in Southeast Asia. Um, thank you, John, and the APIDs team for the for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Todd.